I made this awesome 3D printed injection mold and I've shot hundreds of baits through it in the past few weeks. I'll show you how you can take your lure designs and turn them into injection mold in this multi-part series. Let's get rolling. So in part one of this series, we're gonna cover the 3D printers, the resins, and we're gonna to touch briefly on how you actually print these molds. In part two, we're gonna go much deeper into the mold design to show you some of the tips and tricks I've learned during this process. I've spent the past few months printing tons and tons of injection molds. I have made tons and tons of mistakes while doing that. The uh, pile of mistakes I have is much, much bigger than the pile of successes. So for the past few weeks, I've really kind of hit a stride of good repeatable results in 3D printed injection molds. And we're here to cover the first part of that, which is really what you need to get started. So first off, of course, you're gonna need a resin 3D printer. People have made injection molds from FDM printers, but none of the materials are really designed to withstand the heat of hot plastisol. It concerns me when I see people injecting uh, PLA, even PETG, ABS molds, because their heat deflection temperature and their melting temperature are both way below the standard temperatures that you inject plastisol at, which is around 320 degrees. Uh, PLA, PETG, they all have a heat deflection temperature of around 230. And heat deflection temperature is just a fancy way of saying when the material gets this hot and there's some pressure against it, it starts to deform or deflect. That's why I strongly recommend 3D resin printers instead. Not only are you gonna get way better detail and way better quality, you can actually use a resin that has a heat deflection temperature of 385 degrees, which is well above the standard temperatures you're going to uh, inject plastisol. So what printer to get? I have an Elegoo Saturn, which you've seen in some of my other videos. It is considered a mid-size consumer resin 3D printer. The, a couple of things to keep in mind when you're looking at resin 3D printers, some of the main differences generally revolve around the size of the print volume and the type of screen. So my Saturn has is considered mid-size. It has a print volume that I don't know off the top of my head. I'll put it right here. And I can fit just about any mold I want to, right? I have a few customers come to me with giant molds that I can't print, but it, it covers most of the basic, you know, six inch and below molds easily. I also have a Creality LD02. The actual name is like a lot longer. It's a lot more funky. And you can certainly print molds with that. You're gonna be somewhat limited in the width, but if you wanna do single cavity molds, or you have small like crappie sized lures, it will absolutely work for you. The Saturn retails for $4.99 on Amazon. If you see any higher prices, that's people just trying to scalp them right now because the demand is really high and the supply is low. So hold out for that $4.99 uh, $4 price range uh, before you buy one. The Creality printer I have, I wanna say is right around $200. There'll be a link in the description below. I'll put the price right here. Um, and it's a great startup printer too. And again, they're both mono screens, which is gonna get you faster print time. The resin we'll be talking about in a minute requires longer exposure and you really wanna make sure you're getting a mono screen to pro prolong the life of your 3D printer. So the other thing you can look at on the 3D printer is the large size 3D printers like the Piopoli Phenom, the Phenom XL, I would strongly suggest if it's your first 3D printer, you avoid those printers. I think the Saturn and the Epax, uh, I think it's the X10, their mid-size printer. Uh, that's kind of the size that really kind of makes a lot of sense, even for your first printer. If you go too small, you're gonna be disappointed. Uh, if you go too big, I think you're gonna run into a lot of printing problems that come with that size of printer. And the Saturn and the Epax, are both kind of right in that sweet spot where it's gonna be big enough to do just about everything you wanna do, and it's not gonna cause you too many headaches. So the longer that screen is on exposing your resin, the shorter its life is gonna be, so you really wanna get a mono 3D printer. All right, let's talk about the resin. So the only resin I can recommend is Soriatek Sculpt. And again, its heat deflection temperature is roughly 380-ish degrees which should be well above what you need to shoot your plastisol. It is a tricky resin to print with. Um, it took me a long time to dial in the settings on my printer. 
So just know that you're gonna have to spend a little more time with your printer getting it dialed in correctly. So the major downside with the Sculpt resin is it does require uh, a heated enclosure or some sort of way to heat the resin to get it up to about 30 degrees Celsius before it really prints consistently. I was having all kinds of problems before I put it into my enclosure to keep that temperature uh, both high and stable. I'll have a link in the description to my enclosure video. It's gonna add about $150 to your cost. I'll have another video coming up shortly where I look at a different method of keeping the resin heated. I'm waiting for a part to come in for that build. And we're gonna put that on my uh, Creality printer and see if I can get that going with Sculpt. And also with Sculpt, it is uh, kind of a bear to clean. I use acetone. Uh, Sculpt, uh, to clean it, you don't wanna have it immersed in alcohol or acetone or anything for longer than about 30 seconds. Uh, when you're going through the cleaning process, uh, it tends to break down and get very, um, I don't know what the term is. I get, it, st it starts to break down and get extra gloopy, I guess uh, you would say. So with acetone, I can dip it in there. It's pretty strong uh, and it evaporates really quickly. So I can dip it in there, shake it in there for 30 seconds, pull it out, and it's gonna start drying and evaporating immediately. At this point, you might be like saying, dude, that's way too complicated. And it's really not that difficult. If you have been pouring soft plastic lures, if you've been doing hard plastic lures with resins, this is all kind of in the same ballpark, right? It's just a lot of different terminology. So don't let it scare you away. So let's talk about the actual process of printing these molds. One of the things that really tripped me up when I got into 3D resin printing is that most of the people that use these printers use them to print miniatures and models and little sculptures, if you will. Um, and so they have most of the tips and tricks you'll find are around those types of prints. And one of the things you'll see almost right off the bat is don't print on the build plate and hollow out your prints. Yes, you can print a mold hollow, but you're significantly weakening the structure. And remember when we're gonna injection mold these, we're gonna smash these together in a vise, at least with some nuts and bolts and uh, to get them to close properly. And if you make it hollow, you're adding a ton of flex in there. Not to mention it makes the actual printing process a lot more complicated. You have to add holes throughout the mold to drain all of the resin that will get trapped inside if you don't. And it's just way, way too complicated. So it's a little bit of more resin to print it solid, but you're gonna get a much more structurally sound and far better mold if you do print it solid. We're literally talking like two or three dollars worth of resin extra. And next up, you'll hear people say, never print directly on the build plate. And really, you know, if I have a miniature with a lot of fine parts, absolutely don't print on the build plate. But I have a large, solid chunk of resin. If I try to position that off the build plate and put support structure all around it, I'm asking for a print failure. That mold is gonna be very, very heavy. And those support structures from your slicing software are not really made to hold that large, heavy of a chunk. And so what you wanna do is you wanna put it flat on the build plate, but not flat on its back on the widest portion you wanna print it flat either on the side edge or the actually, the best way to do it is vertically. Now printing it vertically is the longest way to do it uh, in, in terms of print time, but it produces the absolute best results with the fewest failures. And once I started printing vertically, I could get away with some crazy stuff like this print I pulled off, which I think has five molds on it on my Saturn. And the, the benefit of doing it that way is that time-wise, it is the same amount of time to print that big giant batch of molds as it is to print one of the tallest molds on that plate. Same amount of time. Now the downside to printing it that way is your vat cannot hold that much resin. So I was getting up every three hours to top off the resin vat while it was printing and that was a little annoying. So maybe don't go that far, but you can print three, four, five, smaller molds at a time in the same amount of time it takes you to print one mold. And that is awesome. And so one final tip on printing directly to the build plate, when you're designing your mold, you'll wanna make a chamfer, a, a, an angled edge, 
around all of the sides of the mold in whatever 3D modeling program you're using. That's gonna really help you get it off the build plate later. When part two is done, it'll be right here. In the meantime, check out these other 3D printing videos right here. Take care and tight lines.